In today's episode, we are joined with special guest, Sister Josephine Garrett, and we are unpacking the meaning of domestic church, what it means to live that out, why it's important, and how we can change the world by living out the mission of the domestic church today. We hope that you enjoy. Welcome to Life Beyond the Chariot, a faith and family series from the St. Philip Institute. We believe we are called to not only know, but also to live the truth of the gospel within our homes, in our workplaces, and beyond. We believe we are invited to encounter Christ in the messiness of day-to-day life and to live as his disciples. It is good to be back with you, friends. We're back in the studio. Yeah, it's, it's been, been a, a while. Yes. <laughs> and the best part is that we have a special guest with us again. <laughs> the most, you're the, our most frequent guest, I think, on the podcast, and rightfully so, like the spiritual mother of this podcast, Sister Josephine mm. Garrett. How are you? I'm doing good. <laughs> good. How are y'all? Good. 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 I'm I'm happy. Here. I know. I get all giddy when we're all together. Yes. <laughs> we best. laugh a lot. We do. We One do. day we will give you the bloopers reel. <laughs> <laughs> which yes <laughs> would love that yes yes so recently sister josephine gave a talk at you've been all over the place giving talks all over the country it seems like but we had the privilege of having you at the together in holiness conference and here in the diocese of tyler and you gave a phenomenal talk on the domestic church and so we thought that it would be really great to just have a conversation about domestic church because we hear that term all the time um, but we can get a little fuzzy on what that actually means. Yes. So will you help us break that open today? Sure. When, I mean, at the talk, one of the things that was important for me to do was to back up a little bit before beginning with domestic church to begin with the human person. Because a proper understanding of the human person leads us to a proper understanding of the domestic church. And I think sometimes, um, I was saying at the conference, I grew up Baptist, and so we know how to be, like, look like we're religiously engaged when we're not, right? So someone will say something, and I'm not listening, right? You got to say amen and this to the pastor, but you may be trying to help kids, right? So you don't know what he said, but you're like, amen, yes, Lord. I think sometimes we do have the church, too. We're like, domestic church, it's all, mm, yes, yes. You know, and it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And so we all these words come up in the church and they're beautiful and they're rich. Mm. Um, but we do need to take time with them to make sure that they are resting down in our hearts and not just on our minds and then floating off from our mind and never have a chance to transform us. Mm. And so I, at the conference, it was important for me to begin with the human person. The sisters talk about this information that um, – we know this from our church documents that we are made to make a gift of ourselves. We cannot know ourselves except through a sincere gift of ourselves. But if I'm going to hand someone a gift, I have to have it in my hands. Mm. And so if I don't have myself in my hands, how can I make a gift of myself? Mm. Mm. So if I haven't taken the time to do that earnest work to understand, you know, what's at work in me. And so at the conference, I began with that, like, who, who are we? And there's this quote I love from Cardinal Seurat. I use it too much, but I don't think it can be used <laughs> at the same time too much. And it's a, it came from an article that he wrote. Uh, it was called His Warning to the West. Mm. And he said, our problem in the West is our rejection of fatherhood. And he said, civilized man is fundamentally an heir. He receives a history, a culture, a language, a name, a family, a network of dependents, heritage, Sorry, I'm, I'm reading wrong. A name of family. This is what distinguishes him from the barbarian. To refuse to be inscribed within a network of dependence or heritage and affiliation condemns us to go back naked into the jungle of a competitive economy left to its own devices. Because we refuse to acknowledge ourselves as heirs, we are condemned to the hell of liberal globalization which individual interests confront one another without any law to govern them besides profit at any price. So what he's saying is when I stand before God, I can only be a receiver of a heritage. Mm. So everything of who I am comes from God. I wrote this in another article. You know, I'll tell this with the kids in first grade. Your hair, your eye color, your skin color, whether you are a man or a woman is a part of your heritage. Um, So we receive everything from God, and that's where we have to depart from. And we receive this 
we have this gift of being made in the image and likeness of God. That's where we depart from and the gift of being made in the context of a family. Mm. Um, mm. It was important for me at the conference, and Mickey, you mentioned it before we started, n- when we have this notion of being made in the context of family, sometimes it gets a little too narrow. Our, our families are incredibly important in salvation history, right? That nuclear family. But ultimately, we are a family in God, and that's why I love our charism, because our charism is about spreading the kingdom of God's love which is a familial love. And so it's in communities of love that we come to encounter the family spirit needed for the person to rise up, Mm. to be built up. And so sometimes it's gonna look a little bit different. I'm adopted, I came from a very broken family family with a lot of woundedness. I did, it didn't need to be leave it to beaver for me to be able to be raised up as a daughter of God. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's really important to know that the kingdom is coming in a family spirit no matter what. So if you're from a broken family, God will not cease to bring you into a context where you can know communal love and mutual love and familial love. Mm-hmm. 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 I've been doing the um, Bible in a Year um, program and one of the themes that uh, Father Mike talks about is that Jesus himself, like if you look at the line that Jesus came from, the brokenness and the sin <coughs> that existed in that family line mm-hmm. years back, but God works through that mm-hmm. and then and brings salvation itself. Right. And so I think that's an important thing when we realize like with family, even in those broken moments, the brokenness of family life or community life, that they can be salvific. Mm-hmm. Uh. Mm-hmm. And so he says, and um, when I was preparing for this talk, I looked at, um, I don't want to say it wrong, familiaris consortio, I think, and I looked at some of the church documents. But Pope, John, Pope St. John Paul II says, it's about meaningful communion of persons mm. where love is the principle and the task. Mm. Um, and so that is where we come to know who we are that's the context where we can make a gift of ourselves Mm. um, and live out this image and likeness of God and so that was the first part that was important for me in the talk to begin us there yeah like before we like before we move on to the domestic church to say how do we come into the domestic church as who and to really stress that is so important that I think we take responsibility personal responsibility on for ongoing formation Mm-hmm. and ongoing strengthening and knowing who I am before God, not so I can navel gaze, you know, not so I can be obsessed with myself so that I can make a more sincere gift of myself mm-hmm. and not play games in my domestic church yes. Yes. Uh, to bring yes. my real self there. And so uh, that's why I really wanted to begin there because I think sometimes we can um, not give the the responsibility to attend to ourselves its proper place. Oh, yeah. I love that. <clears throat> Because I feel like it also is such a good reminder of like, I mean, what both of you were saying, even in our brokenness, that we matter and that we matter in the story. (laughs) We matter in the story of um, what God is doing in the world right now. And if anything had been different in our family lineage or Mm. or any of that, we wouldn't be here. Mm. Um, But we're the we're the product of love, but that God has a plan for each and every one of us as individuals and that he brings us into family, whether that's in as, I mean, through community, through our own family life, um, but that God is drawing us together. And I, I keep being reminded of the the um, phrase that we hear a lot from Pope John Paul II, man finds himself by being a sincere gift of, of himself. himself. Yeah. In, the con- in the context where there is a family spirit, because what I guess like underpins the family spirit is sacrificial love. Mm. Um, It's an opportunity for sacrificial love. Um, There was one other thing I wanted to say and it went right out of my (laughs) mind. I don't know what it is, so I'll maybe go on to the domestic church itself. So now we have these individuals standing before each other knowing who they are, made in the image and likeness of God, they are heirs, they are recipients of all that they are. Mm -hmm. We're recipients of the, the breath we just drew we received it, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not, you know, according to my fabulousness, (laughs) it's it's received. And so you have these people standing before one another with this understanding of who they are before God. They are heirs, Mm -hmm. um, they are made in his image and likeness, um, and they are called to be gift and to receive the gift of another. This 
is the stance of the domestic church. Mm -hmm. But it was really important to me at the conference, and it's important to me now, because sometimes we can have couples who are maybe dealing with infertility, not able to... um, physically have children like am I a domestic church yes you are a domestic church your sacramental marriage you are a domestic church Mm -hmm. um and I was chatting about this talk with a friend and she pointed out to me I didn't I had never heard this until she pointed it out to me that um St. Augustine I think it was St. Augustine she said or no she said church fathers spoke of the baptismal font as Mm -hmm. the womb Mm -hmm. of the church and so uh, the significance of being um, of bearing spiritual fruit, um, I think it's there is life, there is life in spiritual conception. So I think it's important for couples who have not been able to conceive children to understand that yeah. that mystery of of life in spiritual conception. So the domestic church is not a new idea. The church fathers spoke of it in my research for this talk. <laughs> the church fathers spoke of it long before. So St. Augustine, he preached that baptism initiated the church of the home. And I love that St. John Chrysostom asked families to make their homes little churches. Mm. I love that. Mm. Um, and I've seen things like that before in different families where they're trying to make their homes little churches. Um I think it's so important. This I didn't talk about in the talk, but I want to say it now. I think it's so important that we let when we teach, when we seek to educate about the church, that we don't forget the role of the senses. Mm. And so, to allow our children and young people to have a sense of the faith, its smells, its sights, its sounds, its touch. Um, and so, when I say kids, you know, today you're going to get to touch this monster. It's, it's like wow. You know, and so just to um, or to bring things into your home that create a sense of the church. Mm, um, mm. I really like that idea of St. John Chrysostom. And I wonder if someone could even write a book like how to make your home a little church and to flood the senses of your children with the church in that sense. Um, St. Augustine also spoke of fathers as the priest of their homes. And I've heard recently Scott Hahn bringing that bringing that to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that concept was always there. I think the Second Vatican Council re-highlighted it. Mm -hmm. We we saw them re-highlight it with the council. I have a couple quotes here. Um, Here's one from the actual Vatican II documents. It says, this mission to be the first and vital cell of society, the family has received it from God. It will fulfill this mission if it appears as the domestic sanctuary of the church by reason of the mutual affection of its members and the prayer that they offer to God in common. So you become not the church, but the sanctuary, Mm. the place where Mm. God dwells by two things, mutual affection and prayer, Mm. mutual affection and prayer. Um, And then later on, Pope Paul VI went on to say, at different moments in the church's history and also in the Second Vatican Council, the family has well deserved the beautiful name of domestic church. This means that there should be found in every Christian family the various aspects of the entire church. The aspects, right? Like the little, the traits, I would say. Furthermore, the family, like the church, ought to be a place where the gospel is transmitted and from which the gospel radiates. And so um, I went on in the talk to, to look at how man from the beginning, when we look at scripture, was always placed in the context of a family. Um, I was reading this article, and it was quoting a rabbi who said, in the Old Testament scripture, family is like air. Mm. Like it just is the, it's what surrounds everything and the context for everything. And so from the very beginning, this is the context that we're placed in. And so... Um, for what? What is the domestic church doing? Um, Pope St. John Paul II said in his Theology of the Body that man is given as a gift to the world. Mm. He's given as a gift to the world and that he perpetuates the image and likeness of God. Mm. So when we have this mutual affection and this common prayer among people who've come together in a domestic church, um, who God is in his in his own life, right? A communion of persons is pushed forth into the world. This is what the domestic church mm-hmm. is doing. And so um, I remember in the novitiate, we were studying um, the gospel of Matthew. And that, um, you know, where Matthew says over and over again, 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. The word 14 is actually David. 
So he's saying over and over mm-hmm. again, David, David, David. So he's speaking of the covenant, the mm-hmm. covenant, the covenant. This is what the domestic church does. Mm-hmm. When the domestic church walks in the world, with every step you say covenant, covenant, mm-hmm. covenant. With every step, with every mutual affection, covenant. With every mutual affection, the image of God is perpetuated, spread. The kingdom of God's love spread in the world. Um, with every common prayer, covenant. Um, The image I like that when I was praying with this was like a thread being pulled through time. Mm. And what a slap in the face to the power, the power mindset of the world, right? Power is strength. Power is large. Power is loud. And meanwhile, the family, the domestic church is like a thread Mm -hmm. that cannot be broken, pulled through time. Mm through quiet mutual affection Mm. and quiet common prayer. Mm. Um, And so I just think it's important. It's um, a very important thing. It always has been for me, like as early as I was learning about our charism as an affiliate, I felt like I would tell the sisters, more people have to understand this. (laughs) (laughs) I would say like more people have to understand like the, the authority the priestly authority of family life. Yeah. The common priesthood. Mm. The priestly authority of family life, right? The common priesthood. As baptized people, you are priest, prophet, and king. Mm. So you have the common priesthood. There's a priestly authority in family life, which means what you do has significance for the world. Mm -hmm. And it's pulling that thread. Covenant, covenant, covenant. Um, So I wrote here, the domestic church is the force pulling this thread through time and history and the world. A single thread that is pulled through the power of God flies in the face of major world powers. Mm. Um, so I'll, I'll just yeah. pause. <laughs> no, like I feel like, you know, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, like my heart is just blazing. And I'm like, this is such beautiful stuff. Um, and the need to understand it is significant, not just for our families, but really for the world and the trajectory mm-hmm. that we're headed on. Yes. Yeah. But it's also like, I'm going to be honest, and I've been working in the church for a really long time, but it's intimidating Mm -hmm. and it feels really overwhelming because there are moments when frustrations hit the home where I'm like, I'm ready to cut this thread, you know, or like, <laughs> I'm cutting ties with the covenant, <laughs> you know, you have or to I may not even be thinking that, but my action, like when we get caught up in like our the intro to our podcast yeah. says the messiness it is Day-to-day so life, yeah. easy to to let that image be either be forgotten or um just clouded over by emotion or just like the the chaos of a particular moment in mm-hmm. the home and so on one end i'm like this is beautiful but on the other end i i I'm experiencing, yeah, yeah, and I'm experiencing this sort of like fear of like, well, what happens if I screw this up? Or what about in those moments when I forget? Yeah, Mm -hmm. so first, I'm going to rebuke fear in the name of Satan. (laughs) I mean, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to (laughs) rebuke Satan, that fear. But also say, like, I think, and I've said this a lot of times before, I am so tired of sanitized and sterilized stables. Mm -hmm. Um, We have Mm -hmm. forgotten the context that the family, Holy Family lived in Mm -hmm. and struggled in and suffered in. We've sanitized it. And I love art, you know, I think, but I would love somebody to do a real deal stable manger scene. (laughs) Yeah. Right? Yeah. The smells and the sounds and yeah. the, the touch and the roughness of uh-huh. it. Yeah. Because then we can find ourselves in it. Dorothy Day, her birthday was yesterday and she spoke about that, mm. right? She was like, I'm so glad my Lord was born in a stable mm. um, so that he would be at home in this mess. Yeah. And so I think sometimes we get under the illusion that we make our families holy. And this is a lie. It is God who makes your family holy. Yep. And so we need to show up for that. Mm. And so we have the sacrament of confession. So when you, and St. Therese of Lisieux teaches this, (laughs) when you mess up and your person you took for your your author last uh, Advent, I think, also teaches us, or maybe the Advent before, um, my guy, Father Jacques Foulet. Yeah, no, he's yeah. so good. He teaches this, that and this is a hard thing to say, but when we are shocked by our faults, it means we need to continue to strive for humility. Mm. Mm. Um, so when I am shocked by how evil I can behave, um, and how sinful I can be, that shock is an indicator that I need to ask God for humility. Because we should not be shocked. Um, We are sinful. Um, We shouldn't be shocked. God knew we were sinful. That's why we have that confessional. Stable was messy, and so are our lives. 
but it is good news that we don't make this family holy. God does. Amen. Um, and so I think it's super important to realize also so that families can feel like they can show their faces. Yes. Um, I love our church in yes. East Texas. It's been a gift to me because our church in East Texas, one of the characteristics that we have many beautiful characteristics of our church in East Texas. One of the characteristics is piety. We have a great love of piety in our church and reverence, reverence mm-hmm. and piety. Um, and I was always suspicious of piety. When I saw pious people, I was like, what you hiding? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on at home? Like, I just, it was a character defect on my part, right? Because now I know people who possess this beautiful piety, who I also know have beautiful homes, you know, beautiful, messy homes. And so it's been purifying for me at the same time. I think when we appear, you know, in our places of worship, you know, And when we gather as a church and everyone appears so pious, you can sometimes wonder where they're keeping the broken people Mm. and where they're keeping Mm -hmm. the struggling people. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, we have to find a good balance for that so that we feel like we can show our face. And the way for us to feel like we can show our face is to remember you were never the one who was going to pull, like, you don't pull the thread by your will. You pull the thread by continuing to be together as a family Mm. Mm. and like keep showing up for mutual affection and common prayer. Mm. Um, And so it's, it's a little bit of a paradox and we just, we just have to be careful with that. Yeah. And what you were just saying, there's there's so many things I feel like I, we could do a deep dive, (laughs) but I think especially with community and thinking specifically of the community in East Texas. um, I mean, just speaking from personal experience, like my, my domestic church, our sanctuary, that language is so beautiful, Mm -hmm. but we're hot mess. (laughs) And like, we're very human. We're very comfortable in our humanity. (laughs) Very comfortable. Um, But there can be this temptation to like isolate from community to say like, Oh, well I'm, I'm not, I have we haven't reached that level of domestic church. We haven't <laughs> unlocked that level of piety or my kids can't stay still during mass. Mm. So or we're going to the cry room more often than we'd like or we have to escort somebody out every weekend. Um so there's there's a temptation there to to feel like there isn't a place for us until we reach a certain a, a certain point or oh, okay, well my kids are older and everybody can sit still during mass particularly or <laughs> we can participate in all these different small groups or something, then we'll have a place at the table. Um but that's not of God. Like hmm. the community is made up of so many that's what makes our community so beautiful is that we're all in different walks. Um but each of us matters. And I think that's one thing that I really took away from from your talk. Um, was that every domestic church matters. It doesn't have to fit in this neat little box. Um, And the temptation can be to think like, well, we just have to work on ourselves and not necessarily be receptive to what God is wanting to do in the messiness of day-to-day life, like our intro says. And not bring that to the table. I heard this great quote this past weekend from a sister who was doing music ministry at a conference. I love it. She And she said it was by Pope St. John Paul II. Um, and I, I need to look it up for myself. I haven't done that. But she said, you know, this is true. Everyone is unique and unrepeatable, which means every domestic church is unique and unrepeatable. So when we do not take our place in salvation history that God is calling us to, she says that Pope St. John Paul II said evil will take its place. Mm. Mm. And so when we withhold ourselves from the table for whatever reason, evil will take evil will take its place, mm. what she's saying. I haven't looked that up yet, but it stayed with me. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important to know, too, that like when Christ came, he... Um, I read this somewhere, he transfigured the family Mm. and gave it an eschatological character. Um, And again, like Dorothy Day says, I'm so glad he came into that stable, this stinkiness, this, I mean, really, truly just Mm -hmm. is scandalous. Mm -hmm. What it means is God is abiding. Mm. God is abiding. God doesn't cease to abide. And our families can get stinky. Like I am a counselor. Mm-hmm. Um, our families can be like stables really in grave ways, right? You have your day-to-day frustrations, and then sometimes it can become very grave when you understand that God is abiding. Mm. He hasn't left there. And this is the power of the domestic church that 
Emmanuel, like is the power of the domestic church. God is with us. God is with mm. us. God is with us. So um, in the context of, I mean, I remember at the end of the conference, I spoke of all kinds of circumstances where we would like to think God is not abiding, but God abides. And Mickey, to your point, it's a tremendous amount of responsibility to know that God is abiding here and I've and I need to attend to that, mm-hmm. right? Like I don't get to check out and think, oh, God's not abiding here anymore because I've started to act a pure fool in my family. No, he's still abiding. <laughs> yeah. And wait for us to turn back to him and let him help us. Uh, but yeah, we we have to bring ourselves yeah. as we are unique and unrepeatable. Comparison is a worthless waste of time yeah. with, the, with the reality of being unique and unrepeatable. Um, and if we don't, evil will take its place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I really want to challenge families because I think we've had a misunderstanding of hierarchy in our church. And I think families have been too silent. Um, And I want to encourage families, clergy need you to learn the discipline of charitable accountability to Mm. your clergy. Mm. Uh, That is one of your roles and duties as members, as, as members of the church is one of your roles and duties of the family is to in charity and as the fruit of your prayer, help our our priests and bishops to be accountable. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes we don't understand that. We're looking at them and thinking we can't say anything to them. And then evil takes its place. Yeah. Evil takes the place of your voice. And so that's a discipline I think we've got to learn is to, in charity and through the fruit of prayer, um, show up and support our priests and bishops um, where we've been called to. Mm, um, yeah. I think it's an mm. important role of the family. So, what else can we? Question for both of you, but like, especially being in ministry. But what should our parishes be doing to encourage all of this? Because I feel like when we hear the language of domestic church, it is in this like flowery, sanitized way, mm-hmm. but to, I don't know, just like affirming the gift of each and every family or reminding families that they matter in the first, but like, how do, how do we do that better? Mm -hmm. I would love it more preached from homilies, like Mm. preached from the pulpit. I would love more small groups. Like I think the more that families can get together, stop isolating. And when they get together, stop pretending and being fake. Okay. (laughs) Um, I think it will help so much for them and it'll be like an unleashed truly really and so um, that small Christian community model I'm just more and more as I grow in ministry more and more an advocate of that we can have big events we can give big talks we can have beautiful homilies but if we're not creating small Christian communities where people can share come together and and it talks about it in Familiaris Consortio, like in an authenticity he actually Mm -hmm. uses the word authentic Mm -hmm. in there if that's if we can't arrive there then um, we won't have what we need. Yeah. Uh, we won't have what we need. And so yeah. I'm just really a big advocate at parishes yeah. of making opportunities for small Christian communities to come together yep. um, mm-hmm. and form and share sincerely um, and help to foster like that mutual affection and that common prayer. Mm-hmm. But also give families tools for common prayer among them um, and examples of mutual affection in the, in the family life. Like, what does that look like? It's a lot quieter and simpler than we would think. Um, but again, to preach that from the pulpit, that there is sanctity in the sim- in the simple yeah. mutual affection yeah. um, of family life. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. I love all Sorry, of this. Sorry, I'm, I'm writing notes for myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I um, love all this. But no, I, I think that you're right. And um, because I've, I've worked in parishes, and I think the idea is like we have to offer a program. For so long, I was like, Programs, What's, yeah. what is the up-and-coming best program mm-hmm. to offer people? And and the more that I was in the classroom, the more I realized the program, I mean, you need sound doctrine. I get that. Yes. But it's programs don't save people it's relationships like we live out all these things in relationship we are not a church of doctrine we are a church of a person who absolutely teaches us the truth Mm. but it is about relationship and i think we do have to really take a radical like um re-examination of how we do catechesis um because if it's come sit in this classroom let's do this talk and think that we have catechized Mm. we are mistaken and so like you said sister i am more and more convinced every day that these small groups 
Um, and does that take more time for the people who work in the church? Yes, because you can't just offer one program to reach 50 Everyone. people. Yeah. Um, that it is working with families, like finding families who would be willing to host something at their house, giving them the resources that maybe work for their environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but once you give the family those tools, like, and I've seen this at work, and it's amazing. Once you give the multiply. family that, it does. It starts to multiply mm-hmm. um, because it's about relationship. Yes. Um, it is about growing, and there is something so powerful and intimidating, um, but so powerful about being vulnerable with people mm-hmm. because it is in that that we like sometimes when I'm t- and I tend to ramble sometimes, <laughs> but when I do that, I'm I'm it's because I'm coming to a realization of like, Processing. oh man, there's something in me that I wasn't even aware of until I started like talking it out with someone else. But that vulnerability and coming face to face with your own weakness, I think the the scariness of that of like actually like having to look at who you really are, Mm. that sometimes the fear of that can prevent us from addressing it, fighting whatever battle that is for myself so that I can now move forward in my own life and in my family Mm -hmm. so that I'm not actually creating a battlefield in the home. Mm -hmm. Like if I don't address my own battles and address my vulnerabilities and my weaknesses, then that is going to translate into now it's going to translate into my home and my kids and my husband are going to have to engage in battles that aren't actually meant to be theirs Mm. because it's Mm. something that I, I yeah, yeah. It's like a, it's like a mm. like a block in the gift, right? Yeah, like a block in the. Uh, this is scripture, which you're talking about. I boast in my weaknesses because they allow mm. the power of Christ to rest upon me. So when I am aware of my weakness, you know, I'm not shocked by it. Then Christ's power rests on me, mm. um, and then I can offer that to others Mm -hmm. offer that to others and so there's a way we do that there's a balance to that but um yeah one of the things that I feel like I'm taking away from this conversation is like I think for so long a lot of us have been in the posture of like well I need to go to the church to receive the gifts of the church like I need to go to the church to receive the sacraments and then I just I check out but it really sounds like what we're talking about is that the domestic church, that each family needs to realize that the church needs you. The church needs the gifts that you bring to the table and that your gifts are going to be different than somebody else's gifts (laughs) and that that's okay. Um, But to to recognize that you have something beautiful to bring to the table and that the, your domestic church matters (laughs) at the end of the day, your domestic church matters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I feel like we could say tons of things, but right. I don't know how we're doing on right. time. No, we're good. This is, it's, it's probably time to wrap up, but this this has been so good for my heart. Sister, you are such a gift to the church. We are so grateful for all the work you're doing in East Texas, but even beyond. Um, but yeah, we just, I just really, I hope people are taking away um, mm-hmm. something beautiful from this conversation. Just the fact that if anything else that you heard today, that mm-hmm. you you matter, that you're a gift, that's not just a cheesy phrase, but that your family matters. And um, that, yeah, that, that whole idea of community and um, bringing those gifts to the table, um, so, so important. But um, thank you, sister, yeah, for, for you being so with us. You're welcome. Um, we are headed quickly towards Advent, which is amazing, um, but I think believe we have a, a book study announcement we do we do um and I'm, I'm actually so happy that we had this conversation when we we're announcing the advent study because you had talked about like mutual affection and prayer mm-hmm. like those must exist in the domestic church yes. and so sometimes i think when we hear that we're like what does that look like i don't yes. know what that looks like and so um i've been reading uh, ahead of time, our book for Advent, and it's very much about relationship, prayer as the foundation, mm-hmm. um, and it gives very practical advice. So I think if people are hearing this and they're like, "Yes, I love the message, but I don't really know how to do that," please join our Advent yes. program, <laughs> um, and we'll give you guys more details um, in the upcoming podcast um, and through our Facebook page. Mm-hmm. So just let us know if you have questions. But we just want to let you know the book that we're using. It's called Habits for Holiness. Um, You can find it on Ascension Press. It's written by Father Mark Mary Ames. Um, And uh, I'm a fan of it already. I mean, I think I've highlighted 
almost everything that I've read. <laughs> um, but this is very practical about um, really growing in holiness, and he starts off with prayer. Mm-hmm. And then he goes into the importance of family life or community life. Yes. Um, and so I'm, I'm a fan of it already, so I hope you guys join us. But if you want to go ahead and get your hands on a copy – Habits for Holiness, find it at Ascension Press, Amazon, you know. So there you <laughs> Love go. it. And if you join the Life Beyond the Chariot Facebook group, we will provide more instructions on what that Advent study will look like. But thank you all so much. This thank has you. been so good for my heart. It's an important topic for me. I yes. just want your listeners, your watchers, whatever, to be encouraged. Um, no matter what your circumstances are, God is abiding. Mm. Um, so if you're struggling, get up. You need to go to confession, go on in there, and God continues to abide. So be encouraged. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Will you close us out in prayer? Sister? Yes, I will. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, in your goodness, in your generosity, in your graciousness, you have given us all that we have and all that we are. Help us to be mindful of you today, Father, of your will. Um, help us to trust that you are good and that you will are good. Help us to grow in being more grateful recipients of all that you have in mind for us, not just as individuals, but also as members of families, of communities, and one day, Heavenly Father, as members of the unity of the human race. Give us the strength to continue to strive to build your kingdom in the individual and particular ways you've, you're asking of us. May your kingdom come, Lord, and may your will be done. And we pray these prayers in the name of your Son and through the power of your Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank Amen. you, ladies. Thank you. <laughs>